Hello everyone and welcome to the lecture covering chapter 16 in your book, Mollusks! Arguably one of the coolest phyla of life on this planet. I'm very, very excited about going over these, uh, this chapter with you and, and this form of life with you. So um, without further ado, let's get started. So mollusca means soft body, and that's because all of the organisms within this phyla have a soft body. Um, they are lophotrochozoan protosomes. They develop in early development using a spiral cleavage um, and their mosaic. They have what we call a trochophore larva, and we'll talk more about what that is a little bit later in this presentation. And they do have coelom, so they are coelomates, and their coelom develops via, via schizocelus um, method and then the interesting thing about the, their coelom though is it's heavily restricted to around the heart um, in some species they also have a coelom that it is uh, encompasses their gonads or their kidneys but um, in the for the most part the coelom is really only restricted to around the heart the mollusks consist of kind of two major body body segments they have their head foot region and then their visceral mass and um, within their uh, body they have relatively conserved um, characteristics most of them have a radula um, they have some sort of muscular foot and then they they all have a mantle of some sort this phyla of life is heavily diverse there are over 90,000 recognized by uh, species of mollusks on this planet and that's what we know of so far so this is a huge group they're actually um, only second to arthropods in diversity so it's a major group um, some mollusks that you will probably be familiar with are clams oysters scallops mussels snails squid octopi slugs chambered nautilus nautiluses the list keeps going on and on and on okay most of these you probably recognize as, as food, um, but some of these maybe not so much. So as I just mentioned, the mollusk body plan consists of two major parts, the head foot region and the visceral mass. And the head foot is where we're going to start first. And the head foot is called that because it basically is the head and the foot, and it's merged into one kind of large mass. And the head foot region is responsible for everything that you would imagine a head is supposed to do and a foot is supposed to do. So it's, the head foot region is responsible for housing the feeding structures in the head element. Um, also, anything that's involved with cephalization. So anything that you would imagine that a head um, would do or the formation of the head um, includes you know, things like the mouth, uh, various sensory organs, including the eyes, and then also the head foot region in the foot element of the head foot is responsible for locomotion of the organism. So um, some key things that you might uh, expect to see in the head foot region are like tentacles and cephalopods, um, also in gastropods and things like that. Um, we'll have tentacles for gripping things. Also, some have tentacles that um, have eyes on the end or photoreceptors on the end. Um, you can also expect to see a large variety of different organs um, that the organism can use to sense its environment, including stratasis and tactile receptors in the foot, or you can also see a stratasis in the head, um, and then photoreceptors, eyes, various things like that are all gonna be in this head foot region. The head foot is able to uh, perform its function through muscular action, and this is different from how the visceral mass is able to function. So I had mentioned feeding structures, and the common feeding structure that's shared amongst most uh, mollusks is this thing called a radula. And a radula is not required to be considered a mollusk, it's just in most mollusks. Some have lost their radula, like some bi bivalves that feed via filter feeding have lost their radula, but the vast majority of them do have a radula. So what is it? A radula is basically a tongue-like structure that has the small backwards facing teeth that allow the organism to um, obtain its food and effectively move it through, uh, through the mouth and into the esophagus to their gut. So it looks something like this. And this is a, a mollusk that is attached itself to glass so it can eat this algae off this glass. But you can see this kind of jagged saw-like um, mouth part and that is the radula and all of these little kind of spiky bits and all these ones in the middle here are all these teeth 
And so if we were to zoom in, it would look something like this. We'd have our membrane, and then on top of our membrane, it would be coated with these backwards facing teeth. Um, and it's better to look actually in this image here. You can probably see it more clearly that all these teeth kind of face backwards. And the radula allows the organism to scrape food and tissue from different surfaces. So let's say that you're a mollusk that lives on rocks and you feed on algae from rocks. They can use their radula to scrape the algae off the rocks and then push that uh, food back to their esophagus. Um, also, uh, mollusks that feed on plant or animal tissue can use their radula as well to remove tissue from their prey and convey it to the back of the throat. So essentially food particle comes in, you know, here it's scraped off by the, the radula and then because the radula kind of keeps moving back to the back of the mouth, it pushes that food back, back, back and then eventually it gets into the esophagus and then goes to the gut. Um, the you can imagine that if you're especially a, a mollusk that eats something off of hard surfaces like rocks, or even if you're a mollusk that is using your radula on soft tissues of plants and animals, these teeth in the front of your radula are going to be worn down over time. And so they're actually being replaced constantly by new teeth that are produced in the posterior region of the mouth. So as the animal goes through its entire life, the teeth at the anterior region will be replaced by new teeth in the posterior region of the mouth um, so they can constantly feed and they don't starve to death um, if all of their teeth get worn down. Um, additionally, part of the head foot is the foot element and the feet are used for locomotion um, and they can also be used for attachment depending on the different species. And due to the way that the, the muscles move within the foot, sometimes uh, these organisms have like a kind of a creeping motion. They kind of seem that they're inching forward um, or kind of in a wavy kind of movement forward. And feet have various morphologies. Um, they've basically been adapted over, um, have evolved and adapted over time to best suit the environment that the organism lives in. So some have like a more of a disc shape for attachment like you'd see in this limpet here. Um, some are kind of what they call a hatchet foot, which is what a lot of bivalves have, which is shown here. And then some of them have been um, modified into siphons, which is what these guys are showing you. These are siphons in a bivalve and, or into fins. So this cute little sea butterfly, its foot has been modified to have fins on the side to allow it to swim. And um, many of these feet can produce mucus. You've probably seen this if you've seen a slug or a snail kind of crawling across the surface and it leaves this kind of mucusy trail behind it. Um, this helps them with adhesion, but it also helps them with locomotion, especially for the terrestrial um, mollusks. The second big part of mollusk anatomy is the visceral mass. And so the visceral mass is essentially all of the organs and the soft tissues that the organism has. And so this includes the digestive system, circulatory system, respiratory system, kidneys, nervous system, reproductive organs, all of that um, that allows the animal to function is a, a part of the visceral mass. And so um, if you look at this picture here, we have our head, region and in our kind of our foot region and then all of the rest of that is the visceral mass and um, all of the visceral mass elements are able to do their job through the function of cilia so cilia put kind of pushing things uh, along and we'll talk about kind of the role of cilia and gills in a minute because um, that is one one example where you can really see um, the presence of gills and the import, I mean, the, import, the presence of cilia and the importance of cilia. Uh, mollusks have what we call, for the most part, an open circulatory system, with the exception of cephalopods. Cephalopods uh, like octopi and squid and things like that, they have a closed uh, circulatory system, but um, bivalves and gastropods and all that, they all have an open circulatory system. And what does that mean? They basically have a heart and they have blood vessels and um, then they have a blood sinus. So the blood goes from the heart through the blood vessels, but instead of continuing through vessels um, and capillaries and things throughout the body, they basically 
end up in uh, the blood interacts directly with the organs in the body cavity and mixes with the um, the fluids of the organism and um, that it's, it's a less efficient system than if you have a closed circulatory system um, as you can imagine the the blood is is now in the body cavity it's not more effect effectively able to get through the body to be reoxygenated, um, but this is actually what's really common in these organisms. But it's not really a big problem for them because, for the most part, except for uh, cephalopods, they're slow-moving um, animals, and so they don't really necessarily need a whole bunch of energy or fast circulation of blood. Um, and we'll talk a whole bunch more about this urban circulatory system when we get to um, talk about insects and arthropods, but. Um, for at this point, just remember that they have an open circulatory system, which essentially means the blood goes from the heart through the vessels and then interacts directly with the, the organs in the body cavity and then um, must be transported back to the heart. And then they all mollusks have uh, something called a mantle which it basically encompasses the visceral mass and protects it, but it also um, forms the shell and the mantle is right here this kind of thin layer between the shell and the visceral mass in this image and uh, we're going to talk a whole bunch about the mantle the mantle is one key um, key characteristic of mollusks and um, some of them have a shell some of them don't have a shell but um, the shell's purpose is also to protect the animal and then um, protect their visceral mass and things like that so as I mentioned, the mantle plays an important role in protecting the visceral mass, and it also helps to, it also is responsible for secreting the shell. But in addition to that, it also engages in gas exchange. So some mollusks, depending on the species, have a lung, um, well, basically the mantle acts as a lung, and then some can have gills, um, but some don't have either. And in those organisms that have neither, they use their mantle to undergo gas exchange. Um, they are, also, the mantle can contain many different sensory organs, um, it, so it allows them to uh, interact with their environment to sense where they are. Um, the, the term stratasist, like we saw in cnidarians, will come up quite a bit here as well. Um, those all can be uh, located within the mantle as well. The mantle forms something called a mantle cavity, and that can be seen in this image here. And it houses the respiratory organs. Um, like I said, they can be gills, or we'll just see the term um, tinnitia used a lot in the um, in the chapter, as well as the, the mantle can act as a lung within this, um, this mantle cavity. And the way that it works for cellular respiration, the gills work when you have um, this mantle cavity is that water is brought in to the mantle cavity and the gills, the formation of the gills looks something like this. And water essentially flows past the gills and as it's flowing past, there are cilia that are present all over. So these are all the cilia all over the gills and they help to uh, facilitate that movement of the water, right? So water kind of naturally comes in and it's brought in through the movement of that cilia pushing water through that cavity. And as um, water is pushed by, air uh, oxygen is being removed from the water and being put into the um, the blood or hemolymph that's uh, flowing through the vessels and so the vessels are here and the blood is running in this direction through the tissues so water is flowing this way blood is flowing this way and that is called a counter current exchange and we'll talk a whole bunch more about this too as we go through the chapter but essentially um, as the oxygen, water's flowing this way, so oxygen's being brought in, blood is flowing this way and being oxygenated. And um, waste removal also occurs in the mantle cavity. So we have respiration that's occurring here and we have waste being removed. Also gametes are released into the environment via the mantle cavity. So this is a very, very important region of the animal um, for their survival. 
and they can also use the mantle cavity for protection. So in many organisms, their mantle cavity actually lies right above their head. And so like when you have a, a snail that you've disturbed and they might you know, go into their shell, um, they're putting their head or and their foot, part of their foot into their mantle cavity um, that's guarded also kind of the shell on top and the mantle cavity um, on the bottom allows them to kind of hide themselves and protect themselves inside the cavity. And um, the, ma the mantle cavity has also been uh, modified, heavily modified in cephalopods to be used for jet propulsion. And we'll talk a lot more about that when we get to cephalopods. Many mollusks have a shell. A shell is not required for a mollusk to be considered a mollusk. However, uh, many of them do have it. And in some cases, the, the, the shell has been so reduced and, or uh, so modified that it's hard to even tell that what you're looking at is the shell. The shells are composed of calcium and they can get this calcium from their environment and from the food that they eat. And towards the end of this, uh, this presentation will talk about how climate change has been affecting um, mollusks and their shell formation. The shell is composed of three layers. Um, we have our, outs, our outer most layer, which is here, that I'm kind of trying to circle in the red, and that is um, our periostracum. And basically that's the organic layer that lies on the outside of the shell. And its purpose is to protect the shell um, that kind of lies underneath. And it's oftentimes like a kind of a brown taupey color. The next layer we have is our calcareous layer, which I'm trying to show in the purple. And um, this is our prismatic layer. And it's essentially, that's the, the hard, dense calcium part, and it's made of calcium carbonate. And then underneath that, we have our nacreous layer which is right here oh that's a terrible color let's do green that's not much better but our nacreous layer which is was that white bit here okay and that layer is where the newest uh calcium is being added to the shell so this will allow the shell to become thicker and thicker and thicker over time and that nacreous layer is the layer that lies right next to the mantle. So the mantle's putting out the nacreous layer, which is the newest calcium um, that's going to eventually become part of the, um, the older, thicker part of the calcium um, shell. And then the outside is the just kind of the organic layer. And then actually this, this little space is how we end up with pearls. So you get like a little bit of sand or irritant um, that gets kind of between the mantle and the shell. The, the cells that make up the mantle will put out this um, nacreous material to um, try to remove the irritant and try to uh, keep it from agitating the, the cells. And that's how you end up with a pearl because over time, over many, many years, there are more and more and more layers of this um, of this material gets built up and you end up with a nice a nice pearl okay um, the shells are actually present in the larval stage of the organism of many organisms and they just basically continue to grow and grow and grow throughout the lifetime of the organism Speaking of larvae, let's now take some time to talk about reproduction in mollusks. So most mollusks are dioecious, meaning that the male and female gametes and male and female reproductive organs are in two separate organisms. However, some are hermaphroditic, so they contain both the male and female reproductive organs to make male and female gametes um, within the same organism. And then another term for this is monoecious, uh, which we've referred to in previous lectures. So during the like kind of life stages of mollusks, many have this trochophore larvae stage, which we talked about um, in some detail in the platyomenthes lecture. But just as a reminder, the trochophore larvae is this top shaped uh, larval form here. And it's characteristic of these ciliated um, regions that allow it to be modal. So it's just basically a modal um, ciliated larval stage. 
and this is an actual picture of uh, what one of these chocophore larvae look like. The metamorphosis from a chocophore larvae into a juvenile or into a, another uh, larval form is actually ancestral to this group. So it's ancestral to this group as well as some annelids and um, as we talked about with the polyhelminthes, those as well. So the trochophore larvae in uh, many, many cases will then uh, develop into what we call a veliger. And a veliger is basically a kind of like a small rudimentary version of what the adult will be. And so um, we talked about, you know, with the, the trochophore larvae, we're going from this kind of top shaped, ciliated, uh, free living modal larvae to another form of free, uh, free, free moving larvae, uh, which is the veliger, which looks something like this. And it has these uh, usually has a, a shell of some sort, which is this kind of um, beige material here. And then it's got these veliger lobes and then it's got the mouth and the anus. Um, and they usually have a rudimentary foot, which you can't see in this image, but you can see it in this one here. Um, this is an actual image of a villager, and this is the foot. And then we have our, our shell. Um, and then they have a mantle as well, which you can't really see in either of these images very well. But just know that a villager consists of a rudimentary foot, a shell, and a mantle. So we're going from one kind of larval stage to another uh, larval, larval stage. And then some um, some mollusks actually lack a trochophore larva stage altogether, so they've evolved um, so that they no longer have this stage. And essentially, the um, the young emerge from the egg as a young juvenile. So um, they won't have either of these stages. They won't have a trochophore or a veliger. They just emerge from the egg as a miniature version of an adult. So now that we've talked about some basic anatomy and form and function of mollusks, let's go through some of the classes of mollusks. So there are eight classes, and um, we're just going to talk about some key characteristics from each of those. So the first um, are the caudofoviata and the solenogasters, and these don't even look like what you would normally think would be a mollusk. They actually look like worms. And that both of these images here are showing you what they are. So this is the caldo, caldo foviata. And this is our solenogaster. And so they look really, really similar. And I labeled them so that you don't get them mixed up because they basically look like they're almost the same thing, just different colors. Um, they both lack a shell and they eat microbes and detritus that comes through um, through the ocean in the water. Even though they look very similar, they do have some key differences. The caldofoviata, they, um, they're generally burrowers. And so they dig their way into some uh, the ground and the substrate and the sand. And they have a mantle cavity and they have gills that they face out. So they're, they're, they burrow into the ground and then they make sure that their gills are facing out towards the water column. Um, they have a radula, they're dioecious, and they their body plan resembles what we what scientists believe to be the uh, ancestor to most mollusks. So this is kind of what it's hypothesized the ancestor to mollusks probably look like, this kind of worm-like uh, animal. On the opposite end, well not necessarily opposite end, but on the other side of things, we have the solenogasters and they have no radula and no gills. So we can already see that they're, even though they look similar, they're not the same. They're also hermaphroditic, so they're monoecious. Um, they are bottom dwellers, so they don't burrow necessarily, but they do live kind of on the um, on the ocean floor, and they feed on cnidarians. So um, you can see that even though they're similar, they're not the same. So make sure you remember some key differences, uh, these key differences between these two classes. The next class um, are polyplacophora, and essentially their main means many plate bearers. Um, their backs usually consist of seven to eight overlapping plates. And um, in this picture, you can kind of see those plates. They've got, this one has, you know, one plate, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight plates. Okay. And um, they're generally flat, kind of more flat and convex. So they kind of like kind of sit like this a little bit um, towards on the ground. Um, they like to live on rocks which you can imagine being a flat convex animal that would really help facilitate life on rocks. They do have a radula and they eat algae and um, off of those rocks. So like I was talking about, you can use a radula to scrape off algae from hard surfaces. That's what these do. On a few occasions, some are predatory, um, but the vast majority of them eat algae. Some of them have a very extensive mantle that even covers um, oh, their, their back plates and their foot. So a good example is uh, this image here. This almost looks like a big blob of Play-Doh, but actually um, this is a polyplacophora, but their, its mantle has covered all of its plates and its foot. So it just looks like a big blob, but it actually underneath still has those plates. Um, they have many gills. They sometimes have will have uh, various sets of gills. They're dioecious. Um, they do have a trochophore larva, um, but their trochophore larva uh, develops directly into a juvenile. So they don't have that uh, villager stage in their life cycle. And um, these two are some examples of uh, polyplacophora. Next, we have monoplacophora, and it basically means bare of one plate. And that's because instead of having multiple plates um, on their back, they just have the one. And they were previously believed to be extinct until relatively recently. They were found to be alive, and now we recognize several different species of monoplacophora. They do have a radula as well. Um, it might be a, a bit complicated to see, but in this image, it's supposed to show you kind of, this is where the mouth is and the radula would be located there. They have something very interesting about their morphology. They have pseudo segmentation. So they're not actually segmented um, organisms. We don't really start seeing segmentation until we get to our annelids, which is our next chapter, but they do have um, pairs of uh, or multiples of various organs that kind of gives the most segmented like body plan. So for example, they've got two to six, uh, three to six pairs of gills, two pairs of um, heart atria, two to three pairs of gonads, like they've got multiples of these things. And that is leading towards kind of some sort of elements of segmentation, but they are not segmented. So keep that in mind. Um, also, this this repetitive uh, format is also seen in our chitons, which um, was our, some of our polyplacophores, but not to this much of an extent. Um, these have a lot more multiples or replicates of uh, their organs than we, than we see in the, the monoplacophores. And the fact that we see this kind of pseudo segmentation, if you will, due to repeating units of, of organs, um, in the chitons and in monoplacophora may suggest a common ancestor or um, an analogous character. Scientists are not quite sure, but they're still trying to kind of figure out where does monoplacophora fit um, and is this kind of pseudo segmentation homologous or analogous to uh, monoplacophora and polyplacophora? And then where does that relate to the segmentation we see in annelids and invertebrates and things like that? Um, the next class is gastropods, gastropoda. And this class is the largest class in mollusks. Um, there's a lot of debate on the taxonomic structure of a lot of the um, different species that lie within this uh, this class and this grouping is so large I couldn't put all the details on one slide I had to actually do a couple of slides just to get all the details of, of this class some examples you're probably familiar with are snails slugs limpets uh, sea butterflies they like you name it there's a, a lot of them so they're generally slow moving 
So if you've ever seen a snail or slug, you know they move slow. Um, sometimes this is due to the fact they have a heavy shell on their backs. And so of course, if you're lugging around a big heavy shell, you're not gonna move so, so fast. But sometimes like in slugs, they don't have a big heavy shell, they just move slow. Um, their shell is actually one big piece. So even sometimes if they look like they're multiple segments, uh, they're generally just one large piece. And gastropods in their development, in their life cycle, they do have a trophophore, trophophore larva that uh, does go to become a villager larva. They have a radula and they can be herbivorous, carnivorous, or scavengers. So that you can kind of see the, the variety already in just what they eat. Um, many of them have eyes. So if you, you can see in this, this cute picture, I couldn't pass it up. Um, this is a conch uh, snail kind of peeking out of its, of its shell. And uh, so many of them have, have eyes on the end of their ten, some of their tentacles. Um, they can also have photoreceptors, stratasists, especially for those that are in aquatic environments uh, to help with equilibrium. They have tactile organs, chemoreceptors, you name it. Um, the, the, some species within this class has it. And they have tentacles as well, which um, we might not think of it as, but the, their eye stalks um, are of snails are sitting on tentacles. And then they usually have a set of tentacles that's kind of smaller towards the front. Um, but they've asked that you might think, I think of them as tentacles, but they actually are. And then gastropods can be monoecious or dioecious, um, but most, either way, most in, undergo internal uh, fertilization. They have a large range that they can live in. So as I mentioned before, they can be snails and slugs. Um, this includes ones that you can see outside in your garden. So they can be terrestrial, they can be aquatic. Um, they can live in intertidal zones. They can live in deep water. They can, they, they just, you name it, they can live in it. Um, they're heavily versatile class of organisms. They uh, generally have a shell. Um, some of them don't. Um, some of them have toxins. Uh, some of them can actually eat um, cnidarians and then reuse the natasis um, or some of them actually physically fight in order to defend themselves so they've got a couple of different ways to defend themselves if need be even though they're slow and sometimes really really soft if they have no shell they still can fight back and um, they can be prey um, to a lot of organisms because even though they're putting up a good fight uh, a lot of organisms rely on um, gastropods for their diet including lots of birds, um, fish, um, small inverted, small vertebrates like frogs and things like that. Even humans, we eat snails all the time. And um, sometimes uh, when it comes to eating snails, you got to be careful because some of them carry parasites. So um, just keep that in mind. If, if you're out in the woods, do not just eat a random snail. You could get a parasite. Gastropods undergo a process called autogenic torsion, and um, it essentially changes the position of all the organs in the body, including where the anus is located. And this uh, process it gives scientists a lot of questions as to what are the evolutionary uh, benefits that are gained from having this process occur. So um, autogenic torsion, or what I will refer to as torsion going forward, occurs in two major steps. And so we start with our villager larvae um, and they have their mouth at the anterior end and their anus at the posterior end and the digestive tract running straight through. So anterior, posterior, straight through uh, digestive tract. And because this is a villager, remember they have a shell, they have their mantle and they have their foot. Um, and they also have these villager lobes that help them swim through the water column. So in the first stage of um, torsion, the uh, foot muscles, the muscles, some retractor muscles in the foot will contract and it basically pulls the shell and the visceral mass in a counterclockwise direction 90 degrees. And so you end up with this L shape in the digestive tract. And then um, the second step is a little bit slower and it's the continued movement of the digestive tract and uh, reposition until it's repositioned right above the head so you can see it keeps moving and then also the the man the uh, 
mantle cavity is also moving um, so that both the mantle cavity and the anus now lie above the head rather than at the posterior end of the animal. So um, as this process is occurring also, you can see that the mantle cavity is developing, so it's really small. And then by the time we get to the um, adult animal, it's, it's quite large and able to um, house the respiratory organs and things like that. And once this process is, is, has completed, the organs are now on the complete opposite side. So any organs that were on the right side of the organism are now on the left, and the organisms that were on the left, I mean, the organs that were on the left are now on the right. So right organs on the left, left organs now on the right. So torsion, uh, detorsion happens in some sub, some classes of um, some subclasses of gastropods where essentially they all came from a ancestor that was torted this way where the anus uh, and the uh, mantle cavity lie above the head but throughout um, their evolutionary history they kind of detorted so they might actually look more like this where the uh, anus is at a 90 degree angle or even completely posterior to the head so this uh, whole process, like I mentioned, gives scientists a really big question. What is the evolutionary benefit of doing this? Because as you can imagine, it would be kind of weird if your anus was near your mouth for um, sanitary reasons, right? So having your anus near uh, your gills and your mouth could result in something called fouling. So um, how do animals avoid fouling? So there's a couple of ways that we've seen um, that different organisms can avoid basically making themselves sick um, and even killing themselves with their own waste because their waste lies near their mouth and gills. Um, they can do this through, they uh, can separate holes. So some of them, like we, you might have saw that, that picture when we talked about the foot, they had two kind of siphons that are going out. And this was so that water um, goes into the gills one in uh, into the mantle cavity for the gills in one siphon and goes out the other and all the movement is one directional and so the the siphon essentially one siphon let's say okay we have our our animal and we've got our cavity and we've got two siphons okay so water only goes in this end to the gills and then it goes out this end, but the anus will be somewhere in this area after the gills. So as water is being pushed out of the second siphon, it's tearing waste with it so that the waste doesn't fall back into the gills, right? You can also have um, detorsion. So some have developed over time, they've kind of detorted so you don't have this issue of it being uh, next to the mouth anymore. And then you can also have, some organisms have lost um, one of their, their gills, so they don't have to worry about this issue anymore because waste is being diverted um, and it's diverted in a way that never interacts with the gills at all, so, or, the, or with the mouth. So there's a couple of ways that organisms have kind of tried to overcome this possibility of fouling, but it does lead lots of questions as to why would this be something that's selected for in these organisms. Uh, next we have our bivalves. So bivalves you're probably really familiar with if you like shellfish. Um, they essentially have two shells there that are held together by a hinge at their um, at their dorsal end, so the hinge is right here. And um, they also have some adductor muscles that lie within the shell that basically help to open and close the shell. And um, so when those adductor cells are relaxed, the shell is open, and when they contract, the shell closes. And then they have a, a foot that they call a hatchet foot. And essentially this foot helps with locomotion it can help with burrowing and things like that. They can ex extend the foot and then the foot fills with blood and becomes engorged. So you ex it extends its foot and then the foot becomes engorged and kind of anchors the, the organism. 
um, to let's say it's digging into the 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 ground and then it basically pulls so this is the organism and then it basically pulls itself by contracting the foot closer to uh, the edge of the foot that's become anchored so that's how they kind of inch forward and um, they also have a shell right and there's so like I said two shells and their shell actually grows from this umbo layer area so that's the oldest part and the shell grows in concentric circles. So if you've ever been on the beach and you've picked up a seashell, you, you know what I'm talking about. There, There's different like kind of rainbow concentric circles that form on the shell. And that's due to the fact that the calcium carbonate is being um, produced, but it all kind of radiates from this uh, point, this oldest point, which is the umbo. Most uh, bivalves are sedentary and they're most are filter feeders. They have no head and no radula. And um, some common examples, like I mentioned, if you like to eat shellfish, uh, you probably had clams, mussels, scallops, or oysters. These are just a few examples of bivalves. Bivalves have a pretty simple anatomy. Um, they have a shell, which is this green bit here. They have their mantle. They have modified gills, which are these these purple areas here and the gills have been uh, modified for filter feeding and they have a visceral mass and they have a foot and their visceral mass and foot have basically been just like put into one kind of unit they're almost inseparable um, and they basically dangle from the center of the organism so they lie kind of in the middle and their um, lay, lay adjacent to the foot and the visceral mass are the two um, gills. They use their foot for locomotion like we just talked about, but they can also, depending on what species it is, particularly clams, they can use their shells to uh, swim away from predators. So this image is showing you kind of like a starfish coming to eat this clam and then the clam just fly, like not flying, but uh, swimming away. And then I also have a video at the end of this presentation if you want to see it, uh, far more action of a clam basically swimming through water. So let me erase this. There we go. So clams, uh, as I mentioned, they have gills that have been modified to allow for filter feeding. And basically how this process works is as clams are bringing in water from the environment um, to bring past their gills, in that water is also uh, particulate matter, small bits of food, organic matter, anything like that, detritus. And so as the water is moving past the gills, there's mucus that's being produced on the gills and the food particle will become stuck in that mucus, okay? And then as the mucus, the mucus is being pushed towards the food groove um, at the bottom of the gills due to the cilia. So cilia push the mucus down and the mucus slides down to the bottom of the gills and is then slides towards the mouth. So it's pushed towards the mouth. And once it gets to the mouth, these labial palps will sort the food into good food and food that's probably not good. So um, very, very large particles will not be used and things like that. And any particle that um, it seems to fit the criteria to be food will be um, pushed into the mouth via the labial, labial palps. Um, so essentially, just to, just to go through the basic steps, um, food gets stuck to the mucus in the gills, then it runs down the gills and is pushed towards the mouth where it's basically sorted by these uh, labial palps and then food that is, um, or particles that are considered appropriate to be food are then um, pushed into the mouth and consumed. Some uh, bivalves, like giant clams, are able to supplement their diet with carbo di carbo carbohydrates. <laughs> sorry, carbohydrates that are produced from um, so uh, zooxanthellae, so the uh, symbiotic photosynthetic bacteria. And many of them have poorly developed organs, but organs nonetheless. Um, I don't know about you, but until about a year ago, I didn't know scallops have eyes. So um, this is actually showing you the scallop eyes. All these little blue dots 
are not decorations. They're actually eyes. And this is a, a zoomed in picture of what those eyes look like. They're very rudimentary eyes, but they're eyes nonetheless, which is to me kind of creepy. Still love to eat them, but kind of creepy. Um, they also have a stratocyst in their foot to help with uh, equilibrium. They have uh, tactile cells, some of them have pigment cells. So um, they do have sensory organs, even though they're not nearly as developed as they are in some other um, phyla. Clams, uh, not clams, bivalves are dioecious. Um, and they can undergo internal or external fertilization. And in external fertilization, you know, they're putting out their um, gametes into the water column and hoping that they meet up together. And then, um, or in some cases, the egg will be maintained and the sperm will be brought in to the mantle cavity and fertilization, fertilization can occur there if it's internal. And then they do have a trochophore larva that develops into a villager larva. And um, some freshwater um, bivalves actually have kind of these parasitic larvae that um, really require the attachment to a fish's gill in order to survive. So they basically will mooch off of the, um, the fish until they're able to survive on their own. And so some of these bivalves will use lures and things like that to trap to trick fish into coming close and when the fish comes close they attach their larvae to the the fish's gills and the larvae will just hang out until they're ready to drop off the next class of mollusks are scaphopoda and they're basically these tube-shaped mollusks that uh, burrow into the sand or the substrate uh, and so um, they have two openings. They have a large opening, which is where their foot is, and that's where they, they use themselves to dig into the ground. And they have the smaller opening that they keep um, exposed to water. They don't have any gills, so they rely on their mantle cavity to undergo gas exchange. And they eat protozoans and um, any kind of detritus and, and small organisms that are present in, the, um, in their soils using their, their foot or these tentacle-like structures here, the capitula, sorry. Basically, they're tentacle-like structures that have sticky um, substances on them that help to uh, trap any fruit, any prey. They also have a radula, they're dioecious, and they have trochophore larva. And this image is um, an example of what one of the um, shells looks like without the organism in it. Last but not least, we have our cephalopods, and they are arguably one of the coolest classes of life on this planet. Um, and they're really cool because they can do a lot of amazing things. Um, they're marine predators. They, they have their foot and their head during their development is actually kind of fused. So you can't really tell where the foot and the head begin and end. And they can undergo jet propulsion um, using their mantle, which is pretty interesting. Um, this group, uh, this class of organisms is so cool that I could not put it all on one slide. So we'll have to go through a couple of different slides. But um, as we're going through some common um, species or types that you probably be familiar with are squids, octopi, cuttlefish, and chambered nautiluses. Cephalopods have many different types of shell morphology. Um, we have the kind of large spirally shells that we see in chambered nautiluses. And then we have something that we see, like I mentioned before, that sometimes the shell is so um, reduced that it doesn't even look like a shell anymore. Uh, this in squid is actually a good example of that. It's called the pen, and it's essentially the shell, and it lies here. Boy, sorry, it's not really good at highlighting it, but um, the shell has been kind of flattened out, and it lo is below the mantle, so uh, you can't even really see it anymore. And then some organisms don't have a shell at all. So octopi are a good example of um, a cephalopod that's completely gotten rid of its shell. Cephalopods can use jet propulsion to propel themselves through the water and essentially what they do is they use their mantle cavity to um, force water out of their siphon 
And so it's not too different from what we talked about with cnidarians and their vellum, where they force water out of a smaller, um, smaller area, and that helps to propel them forward. A very similar thing happens here. The mantle cavity pushes the water out of the cavity um, through the siphon, which propels the uh, cephalopod backwards or, yeah, basically backwards or forwards, I guess, if you will. Um, they can use suction cups for crawling. Um, they can also use them for anchoring themselves and to capture prey. So um, in an octopus, we're very familiar with the type of suction cups that they have. Most people are. Um, but in squids, their suction cups actually look more like this. They are, um, you know, like a regular suction cup, but then they're lined with these, these teeth. And you can imagine how useful that is when you're trying to catch prey, especially prey that can swim away or prey that's fast. Um, so they can use the teeth on their suction cups to anchor themselves into prey and, and keep them from getting away. Um, cephalopods have um, unciliated gills. So in all the other um, mollusks we've talked about, they are able to move water into their um, mantle cavity through the use of cilia. So the cilia are what's bringing the water in. But in the case of cephalopods, they're predators. They need a lot more um, oxygen um, in their circulatory system than what cilia can provide. And so instead of using cilia to bring in water, which is not nearly as efficient if you're a predator, they actually have, um, they use their, their muscles to actually bring in um, large amounts of water and then expel that water. So it's closer to a lung than anything, um, than, than it is to that kind of ciliary movement. And um, let's erase this real fast. Okay, there we go. And this, um, this kind of use of uh, the, the mantle to bring in large quantities of water and then uh, expel it through the siphon is something that doesn't actually occur in nautiloids and that these are the chambered nautiluses and their relatives. And you'll hear me say, oh, except for the nautiloids quite a bit in the next couple minutes um, because not chambered nautiluses are a bit different um, in a lot of morphological ways than the rest of the cephalopods. Cephalopods have a closed circulatory system, and this is um, kind of goes hand in hand with what I'm talking about with having enough oxygen as a predator to catch your prey. Um, also, not, it's not enough just to have enough oxygen. It's also getting that oxygen to the organs um, and the muscles efficiently. And so the open circulatory system is not nearly as efficient at getting oxygen around the body as a closed circulatory system. And so in cephalopods, they actually have a closed circulatory system where you have the heart, um, the blood goes from the heart through the, the vessels to uh, the, bot, the, the organs via um, capillaries and, and vessels, and then back to the heart, right? So the, 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 the blood is not interacting directly with the organs in the body cavity. Um, one really weird thing about their circulatory, sorry, circulatory system that's very different from what we see in vertebrates is in vertebrates, we have our blood goes from our heart directly to the lungs and then travels throughout the body back to the heart to the lungs, right? But in cephalopods, the blood goes from the heart all the way throughout the body, then to the gills to get oxygenated, and then to the heart and then to the body, right? So it's a little bit of a different closed circulatory system that we see in vertebrates, but it's still a closed circulatory system. Many cephalopods, except for the nautiloids, um, have ink glands that help them with escaping from predators. So if they sense a predator nearby and they need to make a quick escape, they'll actually release ink from their, um, from their mantle cavity and into the water column and basically distract or um, um, overload the senses of the predator, allowing, that, allowing them to get away. And mollusks are dioecious. Um, and they actually undergo an uh, interesting kind of uh, interaction when mating. The male uh, cephalopod 
will um, pluck a spermatophore from their own mantle cavity and physically insert it into the mantle cavity of the female. And then as the um, egg is moving throughout the mantle cavity, it'll be fertilized by the sperm. So it's um, internal fertilization and it's, it's a physical um, kind of placement of, of the spermatophore into the um, female's uh, reproductive uh, what's in the mantle, mantle cavity for reproduction. Besides their ability to use ink to escape predators, cephalopods are probably even more famous for their intelligence. So uh, cephalopods are remarkably smart and um, this is due to their elaborate sensory system and their nervous system. They have large lobed brains that allow them to do complex um, things like observational learning. So you can have one octopus will, in one tank will watch another octopus solve a puzzle and they will learn from that octopus how to solve it. And when given that same puzzle, we will be able to solve it a lot faster than the, the first octopus just because they watched and they learned, which is an amazing um, feat for an organism that's you know this simple, if you will, um, to be able to do. They also have large nerve fibers and much of the early work looking into how nerves um, work in even invertebrates was done using their these nerve fibers from cephalopods just because they're so large it's a lot easier to work with them than something that's a little bit smaller. They have um, tactile and chemosensor chemoreceptors in their tentacles and this allows them to assess their environment and kind of uh, know where they are and get details on their environment. They can even discern different textures so they can tell due to how um, keen their tactile receptors are the differences between rough surfaces and smooth surfaces or something in the middle which is also a, a testament to their their brain power. They also have a complex eye with the exception of nautiloids. Nautiloids don't have this complex eye, but um, their eye looks something like this. And this is a, a, a cuttlefish, but it's kind of like a, a kind of a weird W shaped eye that um, is actually, even though it looks kind of weird, is actually more complex than you would expect. And the eye is always oriented horizontal to the ground because there is a stratasis that interacts with it that keeps it oriented horizontally um, with, the, with the ground because it senses gravity. Cephalopods have excellent eyesight even though they're colorblind. Um, they can even communicate visually. So they will sometimes um, change their color or do certain movements to communicate to potential mates or to um, try to capture prey or to um, ward off potential um, potential predators or even potential uh, rivals for mates. They can do communicate all these things and do all these things uh, using just visual cues. There are two homologous genes that are found in the cephalopod eye that are in common with the vertebrate eye. So that kind of leads uh, leads to more questions on was there a common ancestor um, between cephalopods and humans that had um, a rudimentary, well, complex eye, but not nearly as complex as we have in vertebrates? And um, they're also really, really well known for their ability to change color. I also have a video of this um, at the end of the presentation. But um, cephalopods have these um, cells that are called chromatophores, and essentially uh, these cells whether they're expanded or contracted will allow them to change color and um, texture and even patterns uh, in their environment in order for them to camouflage themselves either for um, for catching prey to avoid predators or even to attract mates um, sometimes courtship rituals involve changing of colors and patterns and things like that and this is all facilitated through um, chromatophores that are um, dictated um, by the nervous system. Mollusks and humans have a very um, important relationship with one another, whether many of us realize it or not. Mollusks and humans uh, interactions go way back to even early human civilization where humans used to actually use shells as currency. And um, there was 
actually like one of the first uh, rudimentary um, currencies that humans had was through the exchange of different types of shells. But even today, um, we get accessories and decorations from um, from mollusks, including pearls, which this is, if you've never seen a real pearl, these are actually what pearls look like. They're not beautiful and round, as you can imagine, um, when they first come and they get you know, rounded out and polished. We get pearls, we get all types of uh, decorations and for jewelry, for homes, uh, we get dyes. We also get the biggest thing, food. We eat a lot of mollusks from uh, oysters, clams, octopi, squid, we eat a lot of them so we really really need mollusks but mollusks are in danger due to ocean acidification that is a result of climate change and this is because like i mentioned they they require co2 uh like require sorry they require calcium to make their shells the calcium carbonate from the ocean but um acid um co2 from the environment is causing the ocean to become acidic. So the more and more acidic that the ocean becomes, the uh, less bioavailable calcium carbonate is in the environment for them to use. And so the less calcium carbonate there is to use, that means that they're making thinner and thinner shells, which means that they're not developing properly. And they're also um, not less protected from um, parasites, from disease, from predators, etc. So um, ultimately, the mollusks that we rely on heavily, um, we need to start, you know, helping to protect them. Otherwise, soon we won't have a lot of the food and resources that we take for granted that come from mollusks. So we've reached the end of our chapter on mollusks, unfortunately. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it nearly as much as I enjoyed it. Um, I would say go ahead and start reading chapter 16, uh, section 16.1 and 16.2 um, with you know heavily a lot of the information from there is very important. Also some key details that I mentioned in our PowerPoints about the different phyla um, that are mentioned in 16.3 and um, also doing the smart book assessment for chapter 16. Then I've included some uh, videos here just for mostly your entertainment. Um, so one of an octopus opening a jar, another one of octopi changing color, um, the one that I mentioned about the clam swimming, um, and then this one about the mollusk basic overview is pretty good of just some basic key points about mollusks and then um, one of my personal favorites this last video is of this cute little dumbo octopus that um some researchers found at the bottom of the ocean which was very very cute so i hope you enjoyed this lecture and i hope that you like mollusks as much as i do now if not hopefully i'll win you over with something else in any case i had it i had a good time and i'll see you later <laughs>